Okay, let's get started. Hope you had a good long weekend. Today we're going to talk about attraction and mate selection. And uh, as you can see, I think this is a cover from a DVD case. I don't know if it's a pornographic video or not. Uh, people have assured me that it's not and that that says the art of seduction but I'm not sure I completely trust that person. So uh, I take no responsibility for the possibility that this is an X-rated movie. Um, my only interest in this slide is the interesting depiction of the couple on the bottom. Very attractive, similar in their level of attraction, uh, both looking in one another's directions, wondering how they're going to get to that stage up on top, right? That's the thought bubble is a shared thought bubble, and it is how are we going to move on to the next stage in this relationship, uh, especially if it's something that we both want. So chapter five takes us through uh, attraction and mate selection, an interesting problem. If you're going to think about relationships, if you're going to wonder about the critical question that we're posing in this class, which is how do people uh, create and sustain relationships where they do more thriving than faltering and struggling, how do they do that? We have to wonder how relationships begin and whether there's something about how relationships begin uh, that uh, promotes their long-term durability. So, I'd like you to think for a minute about a relationship that you've been in of, you know, at least a, a couple months, something like that. And think for a minute about the circumstances under which you and your partner met. How did that get started? I can tell you that I met my wife, my wife of, uh, I think it's 26 years now. Uh, after 25, you really start to lose track. After 20, really, you lose track. Um, I met my wife in graduate school. We shared an office together. And uh, our first conversation was uh, arguing over who got the best space in the office. And this weekend, we argued about who got the best space in the house. Like, who gets the bigger closet? It's always my wife. And she wins a lot of these arguments. Um, but 26 years, years later, they become sort of predictable. So my wife and I met in graduate school. We were both in psychology. We were both in clinical psychology. Uh, we were in different classes. We we're actually of different races, so it's not like we're really similar. My wife uh, was born in San Francisco of uh, Chinese heritage. And, uh, but we're really similar in, in other ways. We're uh, both Catholic. We're both raised Catholic. Uh, we have uh, many similar interests and similar tastes. And so our story was one of being in the same place at the same time and uh, really, uh, uh, even though I was very attracted to my wife, the first time I saw her, uh, there was a gradual process of getting to know one another and uh, understand what each other was about. It took us a while to realize that we were both raised in similar ways um, and had similar values, et cetera. Um, so I want you to share some of the circumstances of how your relationship started. And then we'll disentangle that a little bit. Who's, who's in a stable relationship, long-term relationship, but even an unstable relationship, even better? Uh, who can tell us where they met one of their partners? Let's hear about it. Yes, here. You met your boyfriend in the hospital while you were both volunteering. So, uh, and of all the volunteers, why, w and it's a boyfriend? Currently, yes. Currently a boyfriend, okay. Uh, and uh, why, of all the people, did you get connected up with him? Well, actually, we were never supposed to meet. I was going to SMC, he worked at UCLA, but they had a strike, so they asked all the volunteers to come help people get in uh, the OR. So here, so he came here? He came to Santa Monica. Oh, he came to Santa Monica. You were in Santa Monica, I see. Yeah, and so we got randomly paired up to go to the same... You were randomly paired up. And then what happened? So were it, was it just you two? Or were it was just us two for that particular floor. And oh, actually, no, there was a third person who was like really awkwardly third wheeled the whole time. A third wheel, yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, for the next four hours, we like couldn't stop talking. You couldn't stop talking? Yeah. I'm a psychologist. You can say more. Like, <laughs> nobody's even listening. In this room, nobody's paying attention at all. <laughs> we hung out for like the next four hours, promised we'd keep in touch, we went to different schools, and that never happened. Four months later, 
he, on Facebook, he commented on a picture of mine. Wow. And we were like, oh, we never hung out. And we've been together since. Wow. So there was a long gap. So after you guys hung out and had those fun conversations, you actually didn't hang out for a while, and then you got back together. Yeah, because we went to different schools. I was applying to UCLA. But it was difficult, right. And then w did, did the geographic issue get resolved? Well, actually, no. We just ended up, like, you know, for the whole year, he would bus to, to SMC some days. I would bus up to UCLA. Nice. I mean, we kept finding excuses to see each other. So his iPod was broken, so we had to go to Santa Monica. I would have to go to Westwood for 800 degrees or something. Nice. Fantastic. Uh, other meeting stories. Other, uh, yes. So you met, they met in, uh, they had similar interests. Why, are you, why were you both at a hospital? Uh huh. Both pre -med, he's pre -PA and pre so shared interests, right? Similarity, right? Okay, great. Other stories? Yes. Um, high school, AP U.S. History. You met in high school, yeah. AP U.S. History. For about four years. So and you've years. been with him for four years? Wow. He goes to a different school, um, but he's 20 minutes away. But we, it started with we both brought travel mugs to class, even though we were only 16, 15, 16. And we were like, oh my gosh, you have a travel mug? I have a travel mug. We both love coffee. That's all, all took. Of all the people in the world who love coffee, <laughs> these two found each other. <laughs> what are the chances? <laughs> oh my goodness. And it's like the biggest thing in our relationship, like having coffee talks. That's all it is. Nice. So now you even sustain that. You keep yeah. going with that. Very good. And there's coffee right there. <laughs> uh, so uh, of all the people in the room, why did, uh, apart from the opportunity to initiate a conversation with somebody who you shared something in common with a cup of a mug and a cup of coffee um of all the people in the room why why did you feel sparks like what was the what was the connection uh, I, uh, basically he we went to a really ghetto high school um i'm from san pedro if any of you know pedro but basically nobody there really cares about education i see but, and or like anything much but he would read his his little novels behind his math textbook i and see still get the top grade of the class. oh interesting and I really cute even though i thought he did in this class reading. this was in your this ap history my, class well this was in our, our math class i he see would sit there with his textbook like that and read lord of the rings and i thought that was kind of interesting and that was just adorable yeah yeah even though yeah, yeah. he dressed terribly and i did not want a boyfriend no <laughs> so were uh was um, n were nice clothes an issue for you? Like before you met him and had the, <laughs> the whole mug incident. Yeah, I thought, it was, it was, I thought it was good to express yourself, but he just wore like, he just didn't care. He was so, so sloppy and a, a afro, basically. <laughs> terrible, <laughs> terrible. He dresses nice now. So your standard was to have a really good looking guy um, <laughs> who uh, was really smart, who dressed well, and he turned out to be smart and he didn't dress well, yes. but you've exerted an effect. Now, does he dress well now because of you or yes. despite well, you? 100%. Okay. All right. <laughs> Social learning theory, the shaping, <laughs> the shaping model happening and right there. Me for it. <laughs> okay. All right. Very good. That's a good uh, meeting story. Another meeting story? Yeah. Um, I met him in elementary and you met him in elementary school? Uh, in an after school program. In an after school program. And how old were you? I was about seven. You were seven years old? Yeah. Okay. And he was 22, but that wasn't, <laughs> that wasn't strange at all. Like, it, it took a while. No, I'm, yeah, and how old was he? Seven also. He was also. So it wasn't an older man. It was your same age. Um, but our school had different tracks, so we would only see each other, like, certain times of the year. But um, we lost contact after elementary, and then in high school, I think it was, like, junior or senior year, he sent me a message on Facebook, and then ever since then, we so you knew each other. Did you hang out when you were younger? Like, did you yeah. play together and stuff? And that was fun? Play with Connect Four and stuff. You played Connect Four together? Do you still play that? Like, no. is that... Because Danielle has the mug thing going for her. And you, you play Monopoly. It's a higher level game. Good. So, um, so who sent the Facebook message? I requested him, and then he sent me a message. I see. And what happened then? Like, did you just chat by Facebook, or did you have a well, conversation? Were you in the same high school? No. Oh, I see. And uh, we started talking, but we were recently like in a different relationship. I see. And then so we stopped talking for like a year, and then we both broke up. And then uh, freshman year in college, we started talking, and then things got serious. Wow. So the relationships you were in took their course, mm -hmm. but you, are, you had known him, and you were sort of in touch with him. Yeah. And then when those relationships broke up, off you went. Yeah. Did, well, I'm going to ask a delicate question okay. now. Did those relationships break up because you knew this guy? No. Okay, all right. 
it's on tape now. This is all podcast, so I think any legal responsibilities you have to that ex-partner are now uh, forgiven. There's no on- ongoing responsibility there. Other uh, uh, meeting stories. Yes, here. You met yours where? In the club. In a club. I see. Okay. Tell us more about this club. And wh- who did you go to the club with? Me and my, my best friend. We went and... So you had a wingman. Yes. Had a wingman. And he was there with one of his best friends, and he's from Germany. And so... Your partner is from Germany. Yes, uh-huh. And it, this is in L.A.? Yes, it was uh-huh. in L.A. Uh-huh. I see. So is he just visiting town temporarily? Yeah, he was down here to go to Cal State L.A. Oh, I see. Oh, he was in school. Mm-hmm. I see. Yeah, so he just came over and we started talking. So he initiated a conversation. Did eyes lock across the room? Was it? Um, no, but when he came over, I actually couldn't speak to him. I made a fool out of myself because I thought he was really pretty. You thought he was pretty. Yeah, he uh-huh. was really nice. So you were sort of speechless. Yeah. I see. And I ran away, and then he followed me. You ran away. He followed you. Huh. Yeah. Do you think he followed you uh, because, A, he knew you thought he was attractive, and because you were speechless, did he, did he say, oh my gosh, I've got one on the hook now. Like this, I, I know, these are the signals. And this is not a time to turn away. This is a time to pursue. Yeah, it was a little. Yeah, a little like that. that. Mm-hmm. And then once you did start chatting, what was, because uh, he's from a totally different country. Like, what's up with that? We had so many culture differences. Yeah, right. On. I had to really learn all of that. Uh-huh. Um, but after we went through all that and had a lot of, Miscommunications about it. So many miscommunications. You did. Oh, it, that was, so I, I don't know if you're hearing in the back, but uh, the boyfriend's from Germany and you're not, uh, and um, that there was miscommunication about that. What would be an example of a like a oh, uh, a, so. a struggling a moment where you said, "What's up with these Germans?" Or Germans are very, they're very like alpha male, won't cry, any of that, or at least he embodies that a lot. Oh, uh huh. And sometimes when he would talk to me there would be like a monotone, kind of rude almost aspect to how he would speak to oh, me. Oh, uh-huh. Even though he might be joking or, you know, stuff like this. And I thought he was just being blunt and rude. There's some, it felt mean. You interpreted it as meanness. Yeah. Uh-huh. And once I brought that up with him, when I was really getting it to the point where I couldn't take <laughs> it anymore, he just, then his emotion came out. Ah, I'm so uh-huh. sorry, I didn't mean it. Oh, interesting. Way, and he, so he realized, when you pointed out to him that, you're, um, it, the way you're presenting yourself feels a little cold to me. Mm-hmm. He, he clued in immediately. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh. Uh, yeah. And let me just ask, what if he hadn't? I, what if you said, I'm a German man, that's the way I behave. <laughs> like it or leave it. We actually got to that point. <laughs> I, that once I, I thought, you know, if, if you have to be careful, of course, with what you say, you could expect the worst out of everything. So I, when I put that up there and said, this has to change, or, uh-huh. you know, or else I won't, this, you know? It felt like a deal breaker to you. Yeah. yeah. But, but everything's good now. Huh, good. Fantastic. <laughs> it all works out in the end, doesn't it? Another example, yeah. Um, I met my boyfriend on a beach in Miami. Um, we both ended up renting... Uh, tell me, I just need to get the image. Uh, <laughs> A little bit. Uh, what? Let, let's start with the weather. Nice day, cloudy um, day. Actually, well, there's wait, there's a back. Um, okay. There's a story before that, okay? Because I need to know like how much uh, physical stimuli you had okay, here. So it wasn't like we were both on vacation and like we were on the beach tanning. We both ended up on a random program, like that was like for leadership and like I see. team leaders. Huh. Um, and who like wanted to be like leaders on their campuses and things like that. And I wasn't supposed to go on this program, and he wasn't supposed to go on this program. And I was just getting out of a bad relationship, and he was ending a bad relationship. And we ended up being like put in a group in a sandcastle competition. Sandcastle competition, yeah. okay. Um, Sounds was- innocent enough. <laughs> it was actually pretty cold. Uh, it rained for like two of the four days we were there. Uh huh. Uh, now, were either of you living in Miami, or you were both sort of descended on Miami from other places? On Miami. I see. I live like near here in Westwood, and he lives in the Valley. Oh, so you're both from, both from LA at least. Yeah. Oh, that's a good. And we like just kind of hit it off as friends because uh-huh. he was still trying to wrap up like his this old relationship. relationship. Yeah. And I wasn't really ready to date because I had just been cheated on. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was like kind of like dealing with me, and he was dealing with him, and we're like, okay, like you do you, and I'll do me, and like if it's meant to be, then like. 
It'll work. It'll out. unfold. Let's not force this. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, six months later, like literally six months later, we started talking again. And uh -huh. he's like, hey, like, I'm going to take you out. Wow. Okay. Great. Um, and we've been together for more than a year and a half. Wow, more than a year and a half. So um, what were the, what's interesting about that story is that you were able to meet under conditions where you said, this isn't going to be a relationship. Yeah. So do you think that that allowed you to talk more freely? Because you said, oh, this, it's not going to go that way. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, you know, I'm not really interested in relationship, but I'm interested in talking with cute guys on a beach in Miami. Like, that I'll do. <laughs> Like, I'm not that cold. I'll do that. Well, we just became, like, friends. And, like, we would talk in, like, a group. Like, we spent one night in a group of, like, six people going up and down the elevator. We just sat on the floor in the elevator and went up and down. And, like, we talked about everything. To the so you're getting high on the elevator. So, <laughs> like, if your parents are watching, it's okay to say that? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh -huh. It was fun. It was just pleasant and fun and engaging and exciting. Exactly. And it was really nice. And then, like, I was like, okay, well, have a nice life. Like. And then you both came back to LA, but in six months later to the day, you, you started talking, and he said, oh, that girl in Miami, there was some, that we had something there. Yeah. And he was right. Okay, so these are the ways we meet people, right? These are the ways we get connected. Some funny, random, spontaneous event happens. It's not planned. We're often in a place that we have similar interests somehow, like we're in a travel class or kindergarten together. You know, we're you know, seven years old and hanging out in a school together. Um, physical space promotes it. Then there's often a little spark, a little similarity, a conversation that really uh, uh, galvanizes us, right? And um, really sort of drives the relationship forward. Today, what we're going to talk about is how people in the bottom of this picture get to the top of this picture. And we just heard some great stories about how this happens. We didn't hear as many stories about how it doesn't happen, like how do you get into a relationship and say, uh-oh, no, I'm backing out of this one. I'll give you some examples of that later in the lecture. What I want to draw your attention to, and just as a frame of reference uh, for today's class, I want you to think about uh, uh, these three different stages of how relationships unfold. One is we think about all the people who we might be attracted to in some physical or psychological way, right? Within that group, there are people that we would be um, likely interested, willing to have a relationship with, right? And, from the, and that would be the romantic interest stage, where plenty of people that we're attracted to who we're not going to have a relationship with. And then there becomes a sort of a more than just, oh, he's more than just a good-looking dude. She's more than just sort of interesting. There's, there's something there. I'm feeling a connection. Like, we're sharing a mug. Like, this is serious now. <laughs> and there's a spark there. There's, a, there's a, a kind of a conversation, an interaction that leads you to say, oh, this could be more than just a person that I'm attracted to. This could be a relationship. And then, from that point, there still has to be this additional stage of two people wanting to get together wanting to be together. Because in all the stories you just heard, there was one individual who, um, there, were, there was um, uh, mutual interest, interest on the part of both people to say, oh, I, uh, I really am open to your invitations. I'm open to having a conversation with you. I'm interested in you as well, right? So whereas attraction is something about how I look at another person, and romantic interest could be how much I would be interested in pursuing another person in an intimate kind of partnership. Mate selection is both people making a choice, right? And there's this interesting negotiation process. There's a kind of a conversation pattern that happens that leads people to sort of move forward with their relationship. And you heard a lot of good examples of that. And the last one, the meeting on the beach in Miami and hanging out in the elevator kind of idea, the idea that it's just fun to be with this person. It's, uh, we uh, reveal new things about the world to each other, about ourselves to each other, and it's just enjoyable and pleasant. That sort of back and forth exchange uh, with some uh, important elements of it, which we haven't yet gotten into, that kind of exchange turns out to be really crucial. So let's dig in on this. And 
I'm going to show a video clip in a little bit about this as well. An example from the movie Sideways about how a relationship doesn't go forward. I'm going to be talking mostly about movement into longer-term committed partnerships. Okay? That's not to say that shorter-term relationships happen. They happen a lot. Um, but there, um, if you look at uh, page 186 in the book, uh, sexual strategies theory is discussed. And this is the idea that people uh, engage in shorter-term and longer-term partnerships uh, under different constraints and with dif different contingencies. And by that I mean that men and women um, have high standards for long partnerships. People don't say, um, oh, you know, I'll, I'll settle for anything when it comes to a long-term committed partnership. I, you know, I'll get married to anyone. You'll notice um, that from our first lecture, we talked about how the marriage rates are going down. It's not that people are becoming more, less selective in who their relationship partners are for long-term committed partnerships. People really are concerned about who their long-term partner is going to be. And in some ways, our families and our friendship networks surround us and try to give us advice to make good long-term uh, decisions about who our partner is going to be. But in shorter relationships, something different happens. And here's the something different. It ties in directly with our discussion of evolutionary theory and our differences, uh, the difference be between men and women that we talked about in our last class, which is that in short relationships, men who are already inclined to be uh, interested in casual sex, they will lower their standards. They will have sex with lots of different kind of people if it's a short-term, uh, low-commitment sort of relationship. Women, on the other hand, have a lot more at stake in that game. And if you run the risk of being in a short-term committed partnership, but you have a partner who might not stick around because it is sort of a short-term liaison, a sort of a one-night stand arrangement, then women, because they do have so much at stake biologically in that process, they are more likely to uh, raise their standards, at least when it comes to the resources and status and level of physical attraction of the man involved. So men and women both obviously engage in short-term partnerships, but they get there from different uh, uh, starting points and they go into it with different expectations and standards. And uh, just want to leave that aside, let you know that um, it's in the book. And what I want to talk about more is when relationships really get going, when they really become intimate partnerships of the kind that we just heard about. So what determines whether we're attracted to somebody or not? What determines if the attraction goes to the positive direction or the negative direction? Obviously, personality matters. And part of what we're doing when we're talking to people and talking with our friends about who they know as potential partners, we're trying to find out what people's, partner, what people's personalities are like. We all want to be with somebody who's sort of nice, who's uh, gentle, who's kind, who's trustworthy. We don't want to be manipulated. We don't want to be tr betrayed. We're protecting ourselves. Part of what we do when we enter the dating market is that we are looking out for ourselves. We want the benefits of a relationship. We certainly want that, but at the, in the way that social exchange theory might suggest. But we're also wary of the costs. We don't want to uh, absorb a lot of costs. We certainly don't want to be hurt or betrayed or frustrated uh, in our relationship. So personality matters, no surprise. Similarity matters a great deal, and I'll say more about this on the next slide. Similarity matters. You heard a lot, uh, often we're, we, um, we note the ways that we meet our partner and we say, oh, we're totally different in, how, uh, in the way we view the world, right? But then often when you ask people more about how they met, you say, oh, we were both the same age, we were both in college, we both happened to be on a beach on a leadership meeting in Miami, that just happened. So there's a lot of similarities that we overlook and don't notice, but similarity turns out to be a very powerful feature uh, in uh, moving uh, att the attraction arrow to the right side. Um, familiarity matters a lot, so um, uh, being around somebody like I was with my partner in a shared office in graduate school, uh, being around someone means that you have enough time to evaluate what their personality is going to be like. You have enough time to evaluate whether they're a stable, steady person, whether they really are a trustworthy person, right? So having uh, a number of um, opportunities to see somebody and to see that 
hey, they generally do smile when they see me. They de they're sort of kind. Like that one time when I said, uh, you know, I was missing my notes for that one class, uh, he said that he, his roommate was taking the same class and he would help me get the notes. I, that's sort of a nice thing. Like we're not in a relationship yet, but just having the opportunity to interact, the exposure to another person, to realize that this person is kind of friendly. They are sort of willing to go out of their way and help me. And reciprocation is really crucial. And by reciprocation, I mean this idea that um, there is a, a, a hint, there's a kind of a conversation, maybe it's uh, uh, more subtle, maybe it's less subtle, that I might be interested in you and you might be interested in me. So in the story that we did hear about meeting on the beach in Miami, this idea that... Um, that uh, we're, not, um, we're not really prepared to move forward with a relationship right now. It sure is com convenient that we both live on the west side of Los Angeles, and um, we're in a sort of a place where we both know that each of us is leaving a relationship, right? So there's sort of a, a signaling that um, uh, here's where I am in my life, and uh, we may want to keep the door open. We also heard that in the example of uh, um, when um, people met when they were seven years old. And then later in, their, in high school, they sort of said, that was a good experience, right? We, we sort of kept that door open. And now we can say to one another, I'm sort of interested. Let's, I want to take you out. I want to, let's spend some time together. Let's hang out. Let's exchange mes messages and see what's here, right? So that idea that... Um, that someone likes us. That idea is powerful. We are designed as human beings to respond in a strong way when somebody says, I get you. I sort of like what you're about. And I'm going to wonder about whether you like what I'm about. When that sort of, when both of those go in the same direction, uh, in a positive direction, that is the making of uh, people being attractive and moving on to saying, wow, there's something more than just a, an attraction. There is a, uh, there's a spark here. So here's a cover from the New Yorker magazine. I love this cover because it shows two people on opposite trains on different subways going in different directions, but they're reading the same book, right? So the idea that uh, we share this interest. What are the chances that we're both reading this book, that we have the same mug, that we're in the same club. Like, what are the chances that that would be true? And uh, there might be, that means that you stand out from a crowd of a lot of other people who are my age. And that's the, that's a starting point. That's sort of a really easy way into a conversation, right? So why do we prefer others who are similar in beliefs and values and attitudes? Well, one thing is it validates our own self-worth and it increases our confidence. So when uh, in a math class you see your, uh, pr this uh, guy who is really kind of sloppy the way he dresses, but he's reading a book and he's sort of a smart guy because he gets the best grades in the class and he's still reading Lord of the Rings, well, that's kind of a good thing because I like somebody who's smart. That makes me feel smart, right? I like somebody who likes Lord of the Rings because, by the way, did you like Lord of the Rings? You did. So, so ah, here's somebody else who's reading the same books as I do. Maybe we're a little quirky. Maybe we share this one funny interest. By the way, uh, my wife and I have a very strange shared interest in the sound of music. It was our favorite movie when we were kids. Isn't that that's sort of strange, isn't it? And then I, we went to a, a restaurant in Brentwood and we saw Julie Andrews. Oh, my God. It was a pivotal moment in our relationship. <laughs> We didn't harass her, though. We just said, oh, there's Julie Andrews. <laughs> so that uh, increases chances that we're going to be liked in return. So you like Lord of the Rings? I like Lord of the Rings. Hey, that's funny. And it promotes shared activities and communication. Like, we now have a sort of a basis for having a conversation. We're doing stuff together. Uh, we can talk about things. We have shared interests. It's just easier to get moving down the path toward having conversation. And conversation is really what it's all about uh, in really interesting, complicated ways. So we move from attraction to romance. That, uh, that is Brad Pitt, if you don't know, on the upper left. Uh, some people think he's kind of a handsome guy. Uh, that woman on the bottom right is Angelina Jolie, now his wife. By the way, you know they got married. 
And um, they are uh, famous for being uh, very attractive and not only that, for doing really great things in the world. But uh, we're all, we all recognize, by the way, is there anyone in the room who thinks Brad Pitt is sort of not so attractive? A couple people, but you're in the minority. Is there anyone in the room who would turn down a date with Brad Pitt? Uh, in person. That was, uh, that was really uh, for women and guys who aren't straight. Uh, so we all can sort of tell, even if you don't think Brad Pitt is attractive, you could sort of be willing to acknowledge that, yeah, I could see how other people would see that. Or you could see Angelina Jolie and say, yeah, pretty attractive. We have a general shared consensus amongst us uh, of uh, who's attractive. And most of us want to be in a relationship with somebody who is attractive. And we have to ask that question, which is interesting. Uh, why is it so important? Why is physical appearance so important? And um, I was um, consulting with an online dating company a while ago. And they said, here's the problem we have. Uh, everybody wants to see pictures. Pictures matter profoundly. But there are some people, but guess what? The average person is average in their physical appearance. So if you've got all of your business getting driven to the most attractive people all the time, right? that's not really good for the other 80% of the people who have submitted profiles. So you need to find a way to make sure that other people are judged partly on their appearance, but also partly on who they are and how they describe themselves, what they're about, what their preferences are, right? And so this problem of really trying to get past pictures uh, on uh, internet dating sites is a big problem. And you know they try to trick you and make sure, by the way, I've really not spent a lot of time on online dating sites, uh, but um, they really try to get some basic information to you first before you just, uh, you know, look at the picture and, you know, flip to the left or flip to the right. So why is that so important? Why would, you know, when you think about it, um, it seems like a common experience that we would say, oh yeah, attraction matters. Of course I want somebody who's attractive. But why would that be true, right? And the reason is because we think we will be uh, living in the glow of that person's greatness, right? Uh, people who are beautiful, we assume that there's other great things going on with them. So we assume that beautiful people possess other desirable traits and we seek to benefit from those traits, right? All else being equal, it makes sense to try to hang out with people who will have a lot of resources, a lot of good things going on with them. So beauty exerts a very powerful pull when we think about who we're attracted to. But so does our need for being in a relationship, right? So now we've got two competing forces. One is, oh my goodness, I really would like to get with that person. That is a good looking person. On the other hand, my chances with that person may not be especially high, right? And so we have this desire to say, I still want to be in a relationship. Like that's something that I really want. And yet I also want to try to be with somebody who's attractive. And so um, most of us would rather be in a relationship than be consistently rejected by other people. So what we do in, as we sort of emerge through probably starts when we're very young, probably when we're uh, even before we're adolescents, we sort of know how we stack up, right? We sort of know whether we're hot or not. We know where we are in the pecking order and we try to push the limits of that but still, we know where our comfort zone is. We know, you know where our pay grade is, and we tend to play within our pay grade, right? We tend to play within a, a level of attraction that we know we're not gonna get blown off every time we ask someone out for a date. So we approach people who are in our league, right? We approach people who we say, oh, I stand a chance with that person. I think I, I, that person I actually really should have a chance with. And so as a result, what you do see is that people who are in relationships, ten, all else being equal, tend to be kind of similar in how they're viewed as being attractive by the opposite sex, right? In straight relationships, at least. So there's a matching phenomenon. We tend to match up. It's no mistake that uh, Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie are both amazingly attractive. It's no mistake that the people on that DVD cover that I showed are attractive. 
But even as you go through the whole spectrum of some quantifiable dimension of physical attraction, people tend to match up. And that's because we learn over time uh, who we are and are not going to have a chance with. I'm going to skip over this stuff about situational factors in the interest of time. It's a question, 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 question. Uh, the matching, wouldn't the matching phenomenon answer the uh, why the websites have so much trouble getting people to uh, um, get people to look at the full range right. of people? Yeah, yes, uh, I th and I think that's the way it naturally goes. Um, so uh, when people really do end up um, making choices about who they uh, in, make offers to or who they connect up with, um, eventually people do say, "Wow, there's going to be, you know." I can send uh, an invitation to someone who's, you know, really super attractive that everybody else is trying to have a relationship with. Um, but A, it's costly to uh, get rejected. Like, how many times has that got to happen before you say, okay, maybe I need to uh, um, move down the uh, list a little bit. And uh, then uh, there's also costs of uh, meeting those people, of actually do going through the effort of going on dates. So absolutely. This, I don't know if it solves it from a technological point of view. And, you know, a lot of things that happen on uh, online dating sites happen beyond, behind the scenes. So you, there are algorithms that say, oh, you, here's where you are. Like, here's, we know over time who has sent invitations to you and who you've said no to. So we can sort of figure out what you're most likely to say yes or no to. So we don't want you sort of sending notes to the most attractive people. We're going to only send you names and pictures of people who are sort of in your range. And so uh, those algorithms actually do a lot of the work for us. So you're absolutely right. Yeah. I was just going to say for anyone who's interested in that, um, OkCupid has a blog where they do trends for all the stuff on our website, like how people rate the attractiveness of other people divided up by gender, like quantity of messages being sent, all that. It's a blog. So OkCupid okay, is one of, the, uh, one of the websites that does a better job of actually doing research with their uh, massive data files and uh, um, talks about a lot about how men and women uh, approach each other and uh, how many times it takes before you get a partner, et cetera. Yeah. Other comments, questions? Yes. Do you want to give an example? <laughs> um, she's really pretty and he's really not and they last for a really long time. So how do we make sense of couples where there's a difference? Yeah. Well maybe you know what was he wasn't an actor or anything like that. so we're now talking about Sandra Bullock and uh I her partner's uh, like an attorney or a drug star or uh Yeah, so maybe Sandra Bullock started there, right? She started with all the Hollywood hunks. By the way, isn't it great that we're concerned about Sandra Bullock? I, I just want to comment that I think it's really good that you know, we're concerned about Sandra and her relationships. Um, but the idea is an interesting one, the, the general one, which is how do you account for the discrepancies? One is maybe somebody's learned that, oh, there's a bunch of really superficial, attractive guys who just think the world of them uh, of themselves because that's what the world has told them all these times, right? That they really have been able to date supermodels and guess what, they're sort of shallow and that's what matters to them, right? Um, an, any other ideas about why there might be that sort of discrepancy in physical attraction between partners? Yeah. Maybe like there's status, like there's the best like a special talent, like because that's thinking about Seal and Heidi Klum. Seal and Heidi Klum? Yeah, I feel like they're kind of like a weird couple. They're kind of a weird couple? So, but the idea would be that he possesses some status separately or independent of uh, whatever he looks like, and that that's the appeal. Yeah. And certainly from uh, the evolutionary point of view, that would make perfect sense. Yeah, is that, is that the idea? Yeah, right, right. Yeah, right, right, right. So there's talent. Some people say, uh, physically, you know, you get... Um, 
By the way, I wonder if I can say this very crude Chris Rock joke in class. Hmm. Uh, here's what Chris Rock said. Show me a guy who's got a super hot wife, and I'll show you a guy who's going to get bored really quickly having sex with her. Right? So there's like, you know, when you're in a relationship, you're in a relationship, you really want some depth. You want somebody who, you know, I don't know what Sandra Bullock looks like when she wakes up, but <laughs> believe me, I don't. But she drools on her pillow. I'm 100% sure of that. Like she's, like, there's a point at which, you know, she has to be a human being and our partners have to be deep, three-dimensional human beings. And at some point you say, oh, that's what I want. I want someone who treats me right, someone who's stable, who's there, who gets me. And that's powerful, right? Other comments on that, this discrepancy issue? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, looks fade, right? Uh, looks fade, but an ugly person st personality stays around forever, right? It's hard to get past that. All right, let's skip this situational factor stuff. It's really well described in the book and in the video. Uh, let's talk about this idea, though, of uh, now we're moving from characteristics that we have, preferences that we have, the conversations that begin between us and a prospective partner. <coughs> and now we've got this issue of two people who are sort of interested in one another, sort of similar, maybe, uh, in one another's league, more or less, and are having some conversations. And now we have to say, well, what are, what are those conversations like? What's the, what's the spark that really uh, lets us know that something is going to happen? And again, there's this idea that we can be, I can be attracted to a person, I can be romantically interested in a person, but I cannot be in a relationship unless the other person wants to be in a relationship with me. Right? So now we move on to this being a dyadic phenomenon. And by a dyad, I mean both people have to sort of sign on and at least be willing to engage the possibility. And on page 208 in your book, uh, we describe something called the, the staircase model. You'll hear this uh, one more time before the midterm, actually. Uh, and it's this idea that as you uh, move toward a greater level of connection in a relationship where you get to that step where we might think you've really bonded as a partnership and you're sort of um, publicly out as a couple, like you really are identified by others, maybe you've uh, formalized your relationship in some legal way. Uh, as we move from uh, that, from not knowing anybody at all to really being in what we would think of as an intimate relationship using the criteria we outlined in our first class, there are a number of steps that have to happen. One of them is a kind of an initiating step, really seeing if someone's available maybe or just finding out if they're fun to talk to or seeing what they're up to, finding out what they're about. Uh, then sort of uh, moving toward uh, from an experimenting stage where you really uh, get a hint that someone's available to saying, well, let's now try to get a little more serious. Let's now see what you're about. I want to know more about uh, where you grew up. I'm going to try to learn some demographic things about you. I want to learn if this is even an opportunity. So if we happen to meet somewhere, uh, but you live in a totally separate part of the country, well, that might be a deal breaker, right? A lot of people, in fact, when you, uh, uh, a lot of people in Los Angeles say, look, I'm not going to, it's, it's got to take a pretty great looking person for me to drive from Santa Monica to Eagle Rock, right? I mean, that's, look, there's a lot of traffic there. Uh, so there are some just logistical issues where you say, uh, I, uh, I just want to be with somebody now, right now, in my apartment, and that's how I want it to be. Um, so we have to sort of check those things out. And I want to talk about this intensifying stage, this stage where we say, oh, let's get to know each other. Let's um, exchange things with each other that maybe we're not going to exchange with a lot of other people. Let me start to tell you things that I don't usually divulge to uh, other people who I just happen to meet on a casual social basis. I want to try to test out the depth of uh, our relationship in a small way by saying, guess what? 
this is true of me. And I, it's something that I don't share with a lot of people. And that's a disclosure. That's a, a, an expression of vulnerability. And how that disclosure gets responded to turns out to be pretty crucial. Right? So if that's met with, uh, oh, that, you know, tell me more about that. I want to hear more about that. Or, whoa, I, I can't handle that. That's just too much. Right? I, I'm not going to respond well to that. I might make fun of something that you tell me. I might uh, really have a, a basic philosophical difference with what you've just told me. Like, uh, Lord of the Rings, what are you, what's wrong with you? Like, seriously, couldn't you find something proper to read? Like, I thought you were, like, I was willing to overlook your clothes, fine. <laughs> I sort of like the fact that you're good at math and that, you know, no matter what, you can get good grades. But Lord of the Rings, come on, you can do better than that. Right, there's a point at which you just say, oh, that's, that's a kind of person that I'm just not going to hang around with. But if it goes the other way, you say, hey, guess what I got in my backpack? Like, I'm reading The Hobbit right now. Like, <laughs> do you want to come over to my house and watch The Lord of the Rings? Like, wouldn't that be awesome? Like, let's do that. Uh, now you're having a conversation. Now you're saying, oh, the other people around us, they might not get it. But you and I, we've got something special. We get it. And we uh, connect. And that's at this stage when there's fireworks, right? So what's really interesting about mate selection is that uh, social psychologists in particular have done a lot of studies showing that uh, when you ask people what they're looking for in a partner in some general way, I'm looking for someone who's really dressed well, who really looks good, and then you meet him and you say, Boy, he's a slob, but I, he's sort of cute. Like, I sort of like the Lord of the Rings thing and that whole mug thing. I can't get past that. Like, there's something here, right? And he, uh, we're both in a place where people don't value education so much, but he and I are sort of the brainiacs, and that separates us, right? So there's this connection that we form. There's uh, uh, this idea that what we say in our heads, our principles of what we're looking for in a mate, we're pretty willing to slap that all off the table if we get a person who's quirky and interesting and who gets us, right? So our general ideas don't always map onto the specific person that we end up being with. What speed daters say, in particular, that they want in an ideal mate, doesn't always predict which potential mate they're actually going to desire and pursue. This is in the book as well. We also know that monozygotic, monozygotic twins, so two uh, children who are born from the same zygote, the same egg, are much more similar than dizygotic twins, right? There's two different kinds of twins. Monozygotic, really, really similar, genetically identical. Uh, dizygotic, not, not genetically identical. We know that monozygotic twins are uh, very similar in many ways, but not when it comes to who their mates are. So studies have been done to follow monozygotic and dizygotic twins into adulthood, and it turns out that their mates are not any more similar. And that's because it's two people having to make a choice. Guess what? It's not just the twin who has to make a choice. Someone else has to choose them in order for the relationship to go forward, in order for the fireworks to happen. So what are the cues that people, um, you know, what are the conversational cues that you should look for uh, in order to make a sort of a prediction about how your relationship's moving forward. This is a guy, uh, Carl Grammer, his name is. He uh, studies this kind of thing. And people have tried to study, uh, you know, frame by frame analyses of movies, of people and, and watching them talk, total strangers watching them talk, trying to see which partners go forward and try to connect with each other and have a relationship and which ones don't. What do they do in these conversations? What can you notice in these videotapes? And it turns out that this is uh, not just difficult work to do, and it's part of that observational paradigm that we talked about in week two, in our second lecture. Um, but what happens is that there's a lot of back and forth. There's uh, uh, what we would think of as uh, floor switches. So you say something, I laugh and say, oh yeah, but did you know this? And you might have... Uh, uh, conversations about Lord of the Rings, or you might have a conversation about, gee, I've never been to Germany, but I heard this about, Ger is this true about German men? Is this true? Is this true? Oh, that's funny. That's, tell me about this. Oh, that's so interesting. I heard this was true. 
If you can have those kinds of conversations, that's sort of a signal that, oh, this is easy. This is fun. We can sit on an elevator and go up and down an elevator all night long, and each time we do that, that's sort of interesting. I learn something more. That's easy. That's a kind of a good conversation. And so you think about that as a way to sort of create a conversational platform. There's a back and forth exchange that's just easy and friendly and fun and engaging. And the world seems better and brighter and more optimistic. And that's the person that we move forward with. So uh, that's not always the case. So here is a, wo- a man and a woman uh, at their, what I, uh, is their first date. And he says, actually, I don't think we need counseling. This is our first date, right? So you look for kinds of conversations that open up opportunities rather than close them down, right? And this, if, especially based on what we heard in, with regard to chapter four, men really feeling like they want to have status within a hierarchy, the minute his partner or date says, look, I want us to go to this other situation where it's going to be really difficult and uncomfortable for you, well, my options have just changed and I don't like the way they're going. This is not going to be a productive kind of conversation. So, disclosure and how those disclosures are met turn out to be really crucial. And um, here's what we know about disclosures. They tend to, it tends to happen fairly early and fairly rapidly in our relationships. So once you're sort of moving past that experimental stage and you really are starting to have um, uh, inten- more intense, more personal, more vulnerable conversations, turns out you learn a lot about somebody in the first few weeks, the first few months of your relationship. There's a strong, strong norm of reciprocity. If you are even saying something very appropriate and you're disclosing something about, uh, you know, um, uh, my, uh, some, say you're disclosing something about your parents, something about your father, or some, something in your family tree that uh, uh, you're a little ashamed about. If your partner uh, then, uh, th- th- there is a very strong expectation that your partner will in fairly short order, kind of disclose something similar. And if they don't, you say, wait a minute, that, that doesn't feel right, right? There's a sort of a sense that I took a little risk there. I told you, even if I like the way you responded, but you're not giving me anything back, well, all of a sudden, this starts to feel like an imbalanced relationship, right? So there's a, a very strong norm of reciprocity. This is true even in our friendships. That's not only true of intimate relationships. Uh, perceptions of the disclosure are going to affect whether reciprocation is going to occur. So if I perceive you saying something, uh, if I hear you saying something and I interpret that as saying, oh, you're really needy, like you're just sort of a needy person, and that's something maybe that you tell a lot of people to, or maybe you sort of jump the gun and you say something really personal, the very first five minutes that you talk to somebody, you might say that person uh, is struggling a little bit. That person has uh, a lot of issues, we might say, and that's sort of a too much information step. Like that's a little too much, a little too early. And if we respond to it that way, if we encode that that way, we, say, we sort of say, I'm gonna back off a little bit. That person is struggling and uh, I, don't, I don't know quite, quite what to make of them. Um, but if I'm in this to be in a, a, what I hope will be an equal, equal partnership, then I want a person who has some strength so that when I disclose things, I know that it's going to be uh, perceived in the right way. Uh, Progression of disclosure and intimacy is not always orderly. So there comes times in our relationship where, paradoxically, we start disclosing less to our partner. And one interpretation for that is that the relationship is not going that well. Like we've sort of stopped growing together. Other studies suggest, though, that when we get to that point and we sort of become a little more conscientious about what we say to our partner, that we're actually in a point of saying, this relationship matters to me so much that I don't want to screw it up, right? So it's not as though there's sort of a a natural, I say this, you say this, and gradually you become closer and closer. There are times when we say, 
wow, I don't, I, there, there are things that I don't want to say to my partner because I don't want them to think that I can't manage my life or that my family's out of control or that my brother has all these problems. So it's not always a one-to-one -one correspondence between what we say and how our relationship grows. So disclosure, as I say here, is a key idea in what we talk about as the intimacy process. The intimacy process. And you're going to hear a lot more about that idea uh, in uh, chapter 7, right before the midterm. This idea that how you say, th even not just at the beginning stages of a relationship, but in, as our relationships unfold, that we want to have the kinds of conversations, uh, even if we've been in a relationship 18 months, two years, three years later, where we still start to feel like, wow, that is still a good exchange, right? That still feels like a great kind of conversation. Hi. Come on in. So, um, so let me move on and show you a video clip from this movie to show you a uh, disclosure that does not result in deeper intimacy. And I want us to sort of analyze what goes wrong. This movie, Sideways, any of you seen this movie? Yeah? Uh, not so many, huh? Uh, uh, this movie is about that guy on the left, Thomas Hayden Church, um, getting engaged. And he goes with Paul Giamatti on a trip up the coast uh, through Santa Barbara, and uh, they drink a lot of wine and go to a lot of restaurants. And um, uh, Thomas Hayden Church, uh, he um, starts to screw around with uh, a bunch of women on this trip. Uh, yes, and he is the one who's getting engaged to a very wealthy woman from Bel Air, as I recall. And uh, I'm going to show you a clip from when they've met two women in a restaurant, and I think one of them's a waitress. I think it is uh, Sandra O. Oh. And you're going to see Thomas Hayden Church pair off with Sandra O, oh, and they're going to go to another room and have sex, right? So you will hear them having sex uh, in the background. And Paul Giamatti uh, hangs around, pairs up sort of by default with, uh, unfortunately for him, Virginia Madsen. Uh, an amazingly attractive woman, and they're going to have a conversation, and they're going to try to get to know each other, and I want you to pay attention to how that process unfolds. <laughs> 